Good afternoon. Thanks for coming by, friends, this afternoon for the premiere episode of What the Heart. The HOA with Heart. And we have a hopefully a special show for you that you'll enjoy. We have a special guest with us today, Dennis Deuce, which many of you may know. But you may not know some things about him. And to give a little bit of the heart before we go too far, I'm going to turn you over to Dennis. Dennis, why don't you tell us about where your heart is this week? My heart this week is with these lovely shoes. Um, Good afternoon. Thanks for coming by for this afternoon. Wow. Sorry about that, guys. Even an HOA producer forgets to turn off YouTube. Started playing in the background. All right. So, <laughs> these shoes, that's where my heart is this week. I absolutely fell in love with these shoes, and I just had to have them. No, um, actually, I'm going to be doing a walk a mile in these shoes tonight at 7 o'clock, and then uh, they are up for auction along with Greg um, Trujillo's shoes. So you can actually purchase these babies um, by bidding on them between now and Sunday. So uh, all of this is to support Harbor House of Central Florida, um, and it's part of a project that Greg Trujillo, uh, Carolyn Capern, and myself are trying to develop, which is the utilization of online tools like HOAs and Google Plus to both raise money and raise awareness at the same time for charities. Um, we're calling our project Plus Your Charity, and uh, this is our first trial of what we can do. So hopefully we can make a lot of money for uh, Arbor House and prove how totally amazing Google Plus is for charities. Alrighty. <laughs> okay, can I throw this up? Go ahead. <laughs> Buy the shows so she doesn't have to look at them anymore. <laughs> Uh-oh, she's selling you, Dennis. I think she means shoes. Wait, are you trying to get me out of HOA production? What's going on? I'm confused, sweetheart. I'm also confused because my image came back from that backwards. <laughs> from, um... You got yourself blue box, Dennis. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm also backwards, right? No, you're fine with me. Oh, well, that's weird. Okay, you see the, uh, the quote though, that I put up there, Cheryl? We give you a minute here to load the app because of your bandwidth. <laughs> you here? Yeah, Hello. I'm here. I'm here. What about Dennis? I think he's I... waiting for his app to load. <laughs> can you not see me? Yeah, we can now. Hmm. There, there's your... <laughs> All righty. Thank you, Dennis. And we look forward and wish you the best on that endeavor to help Harbor House of Central Florida. Now what we'd like to do is describe a little bit about how the show format's going to work. We're going to talk about a half hour, give or take a little bit, to our guest each week. Then we'll open it up for questions and answers for each person that in the audience. And that way you can pull the guest. And that, so you're a part of the HOA by getting to quiz whoever we bring on that week. And then... At the end of it, we'll have a little bit of a demonstration or an answer to your questions on drawing techniques and tools and such like that that an artist would use. And we're going to start off here by asking Dennis some questions today. Uh, Dennis, why don't you give us a little bit of background about how you got started in HOAs? Uh, I got started in HOAs, um, I guess last summer I started playing around with them for various uh, 
types of things. The biggest thing I was wanting to try and do was figure out a way to broadcast the um, presentations that I was doing. I, at the time, I was doing a lot of educational presentations to, um, like, the Board of Realtors and uh, places like that. And so I wanted to um, I wanted to be able to broadcast that. I wanted to be able to extend the time outside of the four walls and outside of the time frame so that more people could benefit from the stuff that I was teaching. And so I started playing around. I actually broadcast a couple of those in August and September of last year. Um, and that kind of got me hooked. I could see the power. I still hadn't actually watched anybody else's HOA at that point in time. But I could start to see some power that was there. And then I watched a couple of HOAs in the fall and just fell in love and uh, realized that it was an amazingly powerful tool. And I wanted to use that to try and help uh, businesses and get their message out and build their businesses and market their businesses so that's what I did excellent and by doing that you helped quite a few people like we know about jerky boy and the jerky boys and girls from bikes jerks bike shop and we know about lightning fun and the beloved minor crack <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how beloved it is but <laughs> well it's definitely infamous whether beloved or not. Then we also have something else that you do. You help artists. Now, would you like to tell us what kind of artists you help and what you're doing to assist them in their marketing? So, uh, Christine DeGraff and I have a project we are working on together called Bandwidth. So, Bandwidth is specifically for helping... Um, Musicians, uh, we we have a couple of different things around this project. Um, we're moving into season two, which starts uh, a week from today. Um, and the first show from season two is actually going to be more of a what's going on in the world of music on Google Plus. What um, what are some of the tools? How can we use it right now? And who's using it well? And what can that do for your band? up and into the future. Um, so that's going to be more of a talking type thing, but with an emphasis around the musical arts. Um, and then alternating weeks will be the bandwidth show, kind of as you've come to know the bandwidth show, which is, you know, four or five cameras, multiple locations, um, lighting, uh, amazing sound, if I do say so myself. Um, and uh, live live performances by various bands. We also are going to be doing once a month um, a special piece which is called uh, Bandwidth Remote. And that's not falling on any given schedule. It kind of happens when it happens. Um, we're going to have the uh, uh, Alston family on as our Bandwidth Remote in June. This month it was Ars Nova, Chris Foote's band. Um, and you kind of have to audition. We need to be able to see that we can get a good enough image quality and sound quality to put our name to it. But it doesn't have to be to the level of what we're trying to do uh, you know, here in Utah from Sandy Station. So the whole objective here is to basically try and help uh, independent artists to be able to take on the marketing of their bands and uh, help to grow their, their bands to the point where they can make a living off of what they love instead of being starving artists. A uh, very interesting comment that you make there, Dennis, about the starving artists. One thing that a lot of people that deal with artists tend to recognize, and you can let us know if maybe you have seen the same thing, Artists tend to forget that their art is not their business, that there is a separate side to a business. What have you seen in that regard, and how have you helped those artists that you've worked with 
and other biz, small businesses to correct that thinking and adjust and move forward? Um, you know, I've done a couple of different presentations. Um, I was very active for a number of years in a local um, Park City Artists Association. Um, and I did a number of trainings while I was part of that to kind of help uh, artists understand what it is that they're selling, um, what its value is, and, you know, it doesn't seem to be intuitive for a lot of artists what um, what the value is for their work. They seem very tentative a lot of times. They, uh, they want to undersell their work. Um, they kind of think of, uh, like, visual artists think of the price that they sell their work for as being what they would sell it to the gallery for. Well, most galleries take 50% of the price that you pay at the gallery. And a lot of artists think, well, if I sell a piece on my own, then that's my price. But that's not correct, and it undermines a lot of things. There's just little little things that artists tend to do um, that kind of undermine their business um, because they're not grasping the, the importance of their business uh, as a standalone business. The art is just the product, not the business. Um, you know, I think that's kind of where you were going. Like a clothing store, the business is the business that happens to sell clothing. You know, an HOA producer, the business is, is the business I happen to produce HOAs. It's just the product. Um, and so I think you know, that's something that is important for um, artists to learn and difficult for artists to learn. I think a lot of artists have a hard time grasping. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you there. A lot of artists do overlook the fact that they're creating a product and that art is not their business, that there is a business side to it. And that's not always the easy thing to do. Because in businesses, you've got the promotion, and you've got marketing, and you've got scheduling, and you've got finances, and just on and on and on, the regular costs of a regular business. And then when they want to give their art away, because, well, the gallery charges 500 I can charge 250 for this piece of art. They don't realize that that other 250 might pay the electric bill for that month so they can pay it next month. Yeah. I well, there's, you got a some lot of, there's a lot of extra work that goes in. Like when you when you sell something directly to a person instead of through the gallery, there is a lot more work that is involved, which is work that is normally done by the gallery itself. Um, you know, and again, if you're thinking of the art as a product and the business as a business with the intention of creating a livelihood, that changes that equation and it helps you understand oh I see why I need to sell it for more not just is it going to undermine my galleries and make them really upset but I've got to I've got to get paid for my time my time has value yeah, exactly in fact uh, I was watching uh, hang out with Barney Davy and Jason Jorge's. Barney Davy is an art marketer and Jason Jorge's owns the Xanadu Gallery in Scottsdale, Arizona. They made a point last night that most artists tend to forget and maybe you've seen this be the case too is that the business, the part of an artist isn't selling his art but selling them because people buy from people they know, people they like. Have, have you seen this as an issue with some of your clients, and how have you addressed it? Well, you know, I mean, my background is mostly in sales. Um, whether it's selling my own services, selling my art, or for 20 years I sold roof installations in Park City, Utah. Um, but I've, I've pretty much always been a salesman. And I learned early on that most of the sales training and sales books were bupkis. 
um, that they were really just manipulation techniques and the real value was in books from a much earlier time frame like um, How to Win Friends and Influence People. That's real human interaction relationships. There, everything that's in there would be valuable for building your brand on Google Plus because it's all about human interaction. And I think um, that it's really important to understand that that's exactly what you said. That's exactly what people end up buying. And it doesn't matter what part of sales you're in, even if you work for a large corporation. At the end of the day, the people buy from you because they're comfortable with you. Um, and if there was a different salesperson selling to that client, they may not ever be able to close them. So um, it's really important that the the artists understand the value of building those relationships, whether those relationships are with the gallery or whether the particular artist maybe doesn't do the gallery world, but uh, maybe they're doing you know the tents through art. Uh, fairs around the country, okay? Same thing. You've got to build relationships with the people who come into your tent. Now, that's going to be a quick relationship, very different from the one that you would create with a gallery, but just as vital and important. All right. Well, what about the relationships and social media? How can artists use social media, and not just Google+, Plus, but any social media, to further their art presentation, the presentation of themselves, and reach those prospective customers slash collectors? Well, <laughs> you got a few hours? <laughs> um, <laughs> the basic underlying concept is First of all, you need to understand each platform. Each platform is different. The way you engage on Google Plus is not the same as the way you engage on Twitter uh, or on Facebook or on Instagram or on, um, on Pinterest. Uh, and the way that you present your information and present your art is different in each one of those. So the first thing is you need to figure out which platform resonates for you and then that's the platform you need to study and learn best practices for plus you need to be on Google Plus this I'm actually Steve stealing this from David Amerland but um, yeah your favorite uh, online you know social media platform plus Google Plus is the best way to, to get your content out there. But then beyond that, you need to be looking for who are the people that will want my type of art. Find other artists who have a similar style to you and engage with them. Um, find people who are commenting about art that, that you think would... Um, resonate with your particular style um, and you know hone and and direct your style as well um, it's very dangerous I, I've heard uh, Jason speak uh, a couple of different times and I've read his book um, and it's really dangerous if you as an artist don't have a very clear um, style. Uh, you know, you can't really be a portrait painter doing oils and a landscape watercolor artist and try and make a living that way. It's not going to work. Um, so, you know, it's it's important that you figure out who you are. You figure out who you're trying to reach out to, and then you. Find the ways to use social media to build that uh, bridge and interact and develop relationships that will carry the day. Thank you very much for that. Now, notice behind you there, you have some artwork. 
looks like some sculptures back there. Why don't you uh -huh. tell us a little bit about those? Okay. Well, these are, let me pull this one down. This is actually uh, designed to look somewhat like a Rubik's Cube. It's three-dimensional, as you can see, and it's all made out of woven copper, um, which I reclaimed from job sites uh, in Park City. And then I've done different things to it. I've used chemicals to patina it. Um, you can see here's a brown and a green. Those are two separate chemicals. And I've also heat treated it, and you'll see I can get some yellows, some pinks, uh, oranges, and reds, which you see over on this one, um, out of the heating process. And I just take the scrap copper from job sites, and uh, I buy the copper, by the way, from roofing contractors. It's not stolen. Um, <laughs> I just step in between, you know, if I need some copper, I'll call up some friends in the roofing business and say, hey, what do you got that you're going to be taking into this scrap yard in the next little while? And I pay them whatever the scrap place will pay them for the scrap pieces that I want. Um, and then, yeah, I just chemically treat them, and, you know, I've done different things, like this is a freestanding piece, um, same process, but, you know, it's able to stand up. I've done, a, the biggest piece that I ever do, did was this, this was actually a study for that one, um, and that piece was about six and a half feet tall and about four feet around, and woven up through it was little copper piping, and there was a big watertight copper basin at the bottom of it and a pump in it, and so it would actually spray water out the top of it, and then there were also some places where the water just kind of trickled out down the sides of the weaving. Um, that was pretty cool. That was that was in a art gallery for about three four months back when I used to care about going down that path. Well, so. well, what is, where is your passion now? Uh, my, I think my passion is always in the same place. Actually, um, my passion is creativity and pushing pushing boundaries, um, you know, pushing the limits of thinking, you know. This isn't copper scrap, it's potential art. Um, HOAs aren't just a vehicle to sit around and talk with each other. We can make them into something amazing um, and, you know, broaden the the possibilities of what they are, uh, you know, in in it's just a, a passion for pushing the boundaries and and being as creative as possible. That's I think me. Maybe. Okay, that that's something I don't think I've heard you admit before. <laughs> I know you've talked about a lot of different things, but I think we touched a nerve there. Um, the, the, as far as where do you see the potential for something like HOAs in the future for, say, a visual artist, someone that does the sculpting like your pieces behind you or an artist that does paintings, whether watercolor, oils, acrylics, whatever? You know, there's a lot of different things that could be done. I have a friend um, who is a <clears throat> large canvas, um, semi-abstract artist, uh, focused around um, horses. Um, and so what what she'll do is create these wildly elaborate color schemes. Uh, imagine, if you will, like, you know, six foot by six foot. Um, and then she'll have kind of playing out of it um, the face of a horse, and the horse will be more... Um, well, in fact, the, the, the face of the horse will be incredibly realistic, fading into and working into these muted, wild, flowing, um, abstract backdrops. Um, 
And, you know, she sells one of these big pieces. I mean, she's got quite a following, and so she's selling these pieces for ten and twelve thousand dollars. But she can do one of these fairly quickly. And so she has recently been doing some interesting things where um, I think the first time was uh, one of the Philharmonics, one of the, the big Philharmonics, she actually got on stage with a white canvas and painted um, the entire piece live during their um, concert, which was about a two-hour concert. Um, and completed the piece, and then um, they sold the piece uh, at the end of the show. Um, I think that it would be very possible to do something similar to that where you go through the creation process live and interactive and, you know, even allow people to um, bid on and interact with you during the production of the piece. Um, I think that could be a very interesting use of HOAs to build, you know, you want to use these tools to build relationships and that's going to allow the collectors to get to know you in a way they normally wouldn't and to be involved in the creation process in a way they normally wouldn't. So I think that's certainly one way that it could be done, but the limits are basically somebody's imagination. Okay. Uh, so you would agree then that the, as long as we have this tool available, that doesn't matter whether they're a musician, a performing artist, or a visual artist, is something that they need to take advantage of simply because of the audience they might be able to reach because not only can they interact live with the prospective customers and fellow artists and everything, but what happens after the show is over that makes this so valuable? Well, the video is uh, immediately turned into a YouTube video. Um, there are s multiple signals sent uh, at the moment you start the HOA um, that start to uh, they st everything starts to get crawled um, from that moment on. So, you know, for example, Lightning Pawn. Lightning Pawn doesn't have a website yet, okay? But they've been doing Pawn Boys with me since December of last year. And they have built a following, but I ran, I think it was about three weeks ago, I ran a search on uh, Utah Pawn Shop. And in the top ten, the first page of Google, two of the items that came up were videos of Pawn Boys, including the little thumbnail. So when you looked at the page, there were only two that had um, authorship type thumbnails on there and both of them belonged to a company that has never had a website. Like, an artist can do this kind of thing, you know? They can get in and get interactive, and through creating these HOAs, they create markers that Google is then able to find to help direct people in the right direction. hopefully to you as an artist. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, we're at the halfway point here. Uh, let's see if we have any questions. I see a lot of chatter between the others in our audience. Does anyone in the audience have any questions they would like to ask Dennis or myself? You know, I would like to throw this one up. Uh, Jay Richardson, and I don't know Jay, but... Um, same with what I do, dealing with car, bike shows, and motorcycle rallies. Um, I'm, I'm only kind of aware of where in the show I was at the moment that I uh, 
that he responded to that. But I'm, I'm wondering, what is it that uh, the parallel that you're seeing, um, Jay, in the car shows and motorcycle rallies um, and the art world that we've been talking about? So I'm actually asking a question of the audience. And it'll take a while for him to get back to us. Yeah, it'll take a little bit for the comment track to catch up. It's a little bit delayed there. Um, just a little background on Jay. He is a wood carving artist, if I remember correctly, that uh, also lives here in Oklahoma. He's a little far away from me. In fact, he's going to be appearing at a poker run for motorcycles in Duncan, Oklahoma this coming weekend. And so those in the that go to those shows and some people travel quite a ways for those poker runs will be able to pick up some of his art and stuff in that while they're there for that poker run. Cool. How are we doing there, Jay? Let's see. I'm gonna cheat and look at the other page here and see if he's responded and it just hasn't brought it up. It doesn't look like it. No. Shout out to Kristen Drysdale. She's taking care of her mom today. We love you. Thanks for stopping by. And we have David Leopold in the audience. Yep. We, have a, we have a good friend of you and I, Sandra Watson, in the audience. Yep. There we go. Here we go. Here's what he was getting the reference there. Okay, I was wrong. Somebody else does the wood carving. <laughs> but he says he's dealing with customers one-on-one, -on -one, then watching and what he does live. Mostly he does glass and motorcycle engraving. Now that would be very interesting to watch. Yeah. I'd, I'd be really interested in seeing uh, Jay doing some of the glass engraving. Maybe we can talk him into showing us how to do that one day on one of our shows. What do you think, Jay? Are you game? Oh, looks like David Leopold's decided the weather in his neighborhood is going to get rough. He's got yeah. A tornado watch in his neighborhood. Best to you there, David. Um, yeah, take care. Take cover. We appreciate you stopping in today. Yep. Alrighty, let's see here. I don't guess we're going to have a lot of questions, so let's go over some of the things that most people may not know about an artist, and specifically about this particular artist. Um, some of the tools I use can be quite interesting and confusing to some and to others. For example, who would think that a little shiner board bristle brush would be useful, especially one that's never painted with. But what you do with that is you use it to dust off drawings and stuff, maybe after erasers or if you're using several different types of pencil to kind of do some blending and such. Then there's different types of, for drawing, there's, for instance, these little jewels here there are three different sizes of hardness of graphite there. And those softnesses, as they get softer, create a darker, denser graphic on the paper. Then most artists know what this little dude is. They usually see them in a little square, but it's a needable eraser. Now, the nice thing about a needable eraser is if you've got this little tiny spot you want to erase right in that corner, you just roll it out to a little point like that, and then you can just erase that little tiny spot. Or maybe even if you're drawing a picture where the whiskers are gray. Gee, I wonder where that would come up. <laughs> a vinyl eraser. And what's nice about these, and if you'll notice, mine's not actually the full size because I've already started whittling on it. What you do is you cut it in slices, and you can use it for little corners and fine lines and different things like that. Then this is an eraser you may or may not have seen, Dennis. It's a bag of eraser crumbs. It's tenderly, generally used as a drafters, but this particular, you can use it to do 
an overall service to draw to remove a lot of the excess graphite from a drawing when you're doing them. Huh. Then you have a compass. Most of us use something similar to this in school. This little dude makes it handy, for instance, you're looking at a painting and or to, you're going to draw a portrait of someone. And with portraits from experience, people who are particular, um, it's not like a character. They want measurements close. So if someone's distance between their eyes is a certain distance or their eyes are a certain length or their nose is a certain length or their ears are a certain height because people have different size ears, then you can use this in the photograph. And for example, if you were checking their eye, you would lay that on the photograph and that would give you an idea of a comparison on your drawing depending on whether you're making it life size or a smaller or larger and you'd be able to use the pointers, the compass, in order to make sure your distances stay equal throughout the drawing. Then this one most people recognize from school kids. This little eraser is just That's one of those little kind of eraser. The ever ending non dying eraser. This is one of my very good friends. And the interesting yeah. thing then there's what everybody's familiar with, pencils. But there's something different about these pencils. And that is, if you look right, let's see if we can get the light on. Let's see, we'll roll it over and see if it shows up better on the light. There we go. If you look right here, there's a number on it. This particular one says 4H. What that means is that's a number four hard pencil. Now these go from my particular set, I have 10 of them. They go from 4H all the way up to super soft 8B. In between, you've got uh, a B, an HB, an F. There's, and again, they're different hardnesses, this 4H being the hardest, so it would make the lightest, almost imperceptible marking on it, whereas... And if you're not careful, you can actually cut the paper with a 4-H. I've done it before. Yeah, especially <laughs> if you tend to keep them too sharp. I yep. tend to work with a little bit softer point, partly for that reason. Um, then you've got all, the 8-B would make a nice, bold, heavy line, almost like you were using charcoal. So you want to try to keep that one. Generally, you tend to keep it kind of rounded like this. Yep. Uh -oh. You'll also draw a lot with that one with the side of it. Yeah, and that's where these come in handy. Is yes. Because if you'll notice, I have one that is broken. And lo and behold, see how shiny that thing is? It's dull there kind of, but it's real super shiny there. It's because I've been using it on its side for shading and filling. And I imagine now we'll take a little bit of time and we'll kind of show some ways that you can use some of these to some of the different lines and different things you can make. If you give me a minute here to move them off of the notepad here so that you can see what I'm doing. We'll switch cameras. And you're welcome to draw along if you would like. If you manage to find that piece of paper and doesn't matter what kind of paper it can be notepad uh, scrap paper back of an envelope with a number two pencil so some of the things I'm going to show you today are just some basics so we'll camera for the drawing okay hmm. it didn't like that is it not letting you swip swap there you go it swapped just, just took it a minute there. All right. For example, this is the 4H pencil. Let's see here. There we go. And as you can see, when you draw it, well, see, see all the crumbs on the paper there? That's what that brush is for. Look at there. See there? Just one of the many things that the artist will use that dry brush for. 
But see, as you can see, it's a fairly light line. In fact, I have to go over it several times for you to see it. And that's real good for light shading and for doing the roughing in. Then, it's also really easy to erase. Yeah, that makes it real nice. Good point. Then this one is the F. So you got to get it here where you can see. There we go. See, it's a little backwards, but there it is. And this one makes a little bit darker line. And then here's that 8B. Notice how dark that line is now. Just that quick. Now I'm going to use this one today. I'm going to show you because one of the biggest things that when people are drawing is how many times do you see the house and the house looks good and the flowers look good. And aside from people, what's the number one issue people have when they're trying to draw even recreationally? I thought it was human hands. That's part of the humans that I was oh. talking about, are people. The next difficult one for most people tends to be a tree. Because most people tend to draw their trees. Let's see if we can get this angled here a little bit. They tend to draw their trees like this. Isn't that what the, your tree looks like? Well, kind of. But inside the tree, there's a lot of activity going on. You go out in your backyard, whether it's the flowering shrub in the backyard, or whether it's the big oak tree that's standing in the back with all the huge limbs and the nice shade that you've got the lawn chair and the patio table around and the picnic table or whatever. And one of the tricks is real simple. When you draw on a tree, and the thing is, is you can do this. It doesn't matter whether you're using a pencil. doesn't matter if you're using a paintbrush. doesn't matter if it's oils, acrylic, watercolor. It's all the same thing, and it all has to do with pressure. But you draw on a tree, you start up, and where's the tree go? That limb goes off there somewhere. Then maybe over on this side, you got another one up, and the limb goes over there. And then you got one that comes up and it goes off over this way. Then another one that comes up and follows along and it just goes its own way. And you just slowly, and if you notice now, watch what's happening there to the tree. Notice you're starting to draw your bark too. You just follow it along. And it's just a tree is just that simple. Now you draw your foliage to it however you want it and you highlight around your limbs. You can fill in, do a little extra, and use light press, a lighter pencil or lighter touch, and do the little twigs. And there you got a part here where there's a little knot hole going up. You just put in your little knot hole. Just little simple things like that. And so, see, drawing doesn't have to be difficult. It can be pleasurable with very simple tools. And I actually travel with only four pencils. A 4H, a 2H, um, an H, and um, I believe it's a 2B is the other one that I travel with. So for rough sketching and such like that. Then your, your foliage. It's a little, let's see if we can tip this up here. We can get a little better view here. There we go. Get a little bit of light on the subject. But your foliage, you just kind of just kind of lay it in there just a little bit at a time. The next thing you know, you've got different little leaves, or maybe you've got another little limb going off. You can, this is where you can use that little pencil, and we're not doing so good here. Let's see if I can change this here a little bit. Here's how we'll do that. I just, no. <laughs> Doesn't want to cooperate for me here. Here we go. So, so now we're using the number four hard pencil again. 
I'm going to put in little tiny branches. Little tiny twigs. Maybe it's a tree that those are dead leaves on there. Because you know, the, an artist that everybody seems to remember, very uh -huh. familiar, is the guy with the big afro, uh, Bob Ross. Now, I've seen a lot of people try to copy his skill. Let's change cameras here a little bit. Go back. Come on, there we go. And there's a lot of people out there that do it that way. But with the invention of acrylic paint and everything, a lot of his techniques you can use today. But then there are those like myself that are what some would call a traditional oil painter. So those One of the things Bob Ross did is he had a special base that he put on his paints to kind of help them blend together and it tended to lighten the colors and everything like that and everything. Whereas myself, I tend to do more of a my, my base is the color I want my background. For example, I did a little bit of a joke with a painting like this. Now what are you going to do with something like that? But that's a, one thing that people like is they like characters. But now this painting, I did painted the blue background, then I painted in the basic color underneath of the face, and then started adding layers to get the shading in the eyes and the nose and the mouth and everything like that. And I actually did this two reasons. One, to pick on David Leopold as a friend and as a gift, and also for something that Martin Shervington was doing today, because what kind of serious oil painter would paint something like a character in oil paints? I mean, think about it. Chris Brogan would call us a freak because we do it our way. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. So if you feel the, like, the urge to do something original and unique, Go right ahead and do it. It doesn't have to be special to anyone but you. Mm -hmm. If you enjoy what you're doing, whether it be oil paints or pencils, you can even get oil paints fairly cheaply at your local Walmart in little sticks like this. Those are called oil pastels. And we'll use another show. We'll show you how those work. And we'll show you how you can actually make a drawing where you could almost look like you could pet the creature for the, the way you drew the hair in. Then I'll show you a painting that I have that I did with those the, of that kind of nature. Well, we're getting close towards the end of the show here now, Dennis. And want to do me a favor and remind everybody again of what's special tonight about our and what the heart for today is? The heart for today is these shoes. We're looking for um, people to sponsor. Uh, Kirk's coming. Ryan Miner may come. Uh, we're also going to have Top Jimmy, James Williams there, all walking for this cause. We, we want you guys to just... Um, well, to give, because Harbor House is awesome, and we want to support them. And then, after tonight's sponsorship show is over, then we'll be selling these beauties. Uh, and you can have your own little piece of um, Google Plus history. You can put those on your bookshelf and uh, decorate your home, and it'll be awesome. Now, are you <laughs> going to be getting this... Are you going to be getting the money and then transferring it to Harbor House, or how no, is that? No, no, the work? payments are all going directly to Harbor House. We set up a uh, account, and I'll have to get the link. I'll get the link and bring it back over here and, and post it for everybody. Um, but there is a direct link that we've got set up within Harbor House, so all the money goes to Harbor House, but it's accounted for and tracked as coming from this project. Um, so we're able to see how much we've been able to do to help Harbor House. 
Cool. I got a real quick question here. I didn't notice. We're going to do it up since it's a good friend of ours. Yes. And we'd do it if it wasn't a good friend of ours, but it, since everybody tends to be a friend on Google Plus. Sandra asks, how often do I do my art? Good question. Now if I can remember where I put that. And Sandra, I do that every chance I get. I'm always doing something. If I'm not drawing on the computer, I'm painting in the studio. In fact, things look a little different right now because we're rearranging in the studio and computer rooms, getting adjusted in here in the next few weeks, and then things will, I'll be able to demonstrate some of the actual techniques that I use in oil painting. All right, Dennis, we thank you very much for showing up. We look forward to your walk a mile in those shoes tonight. I wish your feet the best. Thank and you. Again, Dennis is going to put the link in the chat is where you can find the donation link, and your donations will go directly to Harbor House of Central Florida. Yes. Thanks, everyone, for attending, and you all have a very good afternoon.